Good morning, Northridge. Wow. Maybe I just need to get a little bit closer. Good morning, Northridge. All right, that's better. I think about 90% of them are now awake, Rick, and you'll get the rest of them, all right? It's my pleasure today to introduce to you a, a fairly new friend of mine. He is, uh, I've known uh, Brother Rick for about uh, six months now, and uh, we've gotten to, to share some time together, and uh, I know you're going to appreciate him this morning. And uh, he is a former... You can't use the word retire in ministry. I found that out in the first service. But he's a former pastor in upstate New York as well as planted some churches there in uh, the good part of New York, you know, up north past New York City, the, the green part. And, uh, but uh, Dr. Rick Kramer, is, uh, he's an adjunct professor at Clark Summit University. And he is helping us to develop a mentoring process and uh, it's been my privilege over the last six months to get to know him. And I know you're going to get to appreciate him this morning. I want to welcome you, my new friend, Dr. Rick Kramer. All right, I'm going to do it again. Good morning. Good morning. It's a, a privilege to be able to share with you this morning. If you were expecting Pastor David, um, just use your imagination this morning, okay? So I'm the, the shorter, heavier and balder version of Pastor David, okay? Um, or, or the socially acceptable way of saying that now is, I am uh, vertically, horizontally, and follically challenged, okay? Um, but it's, a, it's a, a privilege to be able to be with you this morning and to share God's word with you this morning. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time um, introducing myself, but I do want to share with you a specific story um, that relates to uh, what we're going to talk about this morning. On September 9th of 2020, I had a stroke. And it wasn't a stroke of genius. Uh, it wasn't a stroke of luck. We don't believe that anyways. I had a stroke, stroke, okay? A real, a real stroke. In fact, technically it's called a posterior lateral medullary infarction, specifically at the posterior inferior cerebellar artery, Okay? <laughs> I had a stroke. Um, the doctors told me that the plan was that I was going to be in ICU for about five days. I was going to be transferred down to the neurology unit. I was going to be there for about a week. And then I was supposed to be transferred to a hospital across town and spend 10 to 14 days there doing intensive physical therapy. Um, through the support of my, my wife and daughters, through the the many prayers of my church family and friends, and by God's grace, uh, I was in ICU for four days. I was in the neurology unit for two days, and at the end of the second day, I was able to walk around the unit on, by myself, unassisted, and so they released me, and I was able to do physical therapy on outpatient basis. So I tell you all that, first of all, to, to praise God um, for his uh, miraculous care. Um, it, it's uh, a testimony, and I had an opportunity to share that testimony with my doctors of what, of what God can do. Um, but I share that with you also to be able to say that uh, maybe we have a shared experience. In fact, I, I, I show this picture up here. Um, this was me preaching seven weeks after my stroke. God, God did an amazing work. But I tell you that um, to, to bring honor and glory to God, first of all, but second of all, because uh, maybe you've had, um, maybe not the exact same experience, but, but a similar experience. So like maybe you've gone through some type of physical therapy before, uh, maybe for a surgery, maybe you had a you know, knee surgery or whatever. Uh, really, a lot of different surgeries, there's physical therapy involved. Um, maybe you've been fortunate enough, you've never had to go through a surgery. Uh, maybe you just had like a, a coach that was really hard on you. Or maybe you've done some uh, exercise programs and you had a trainer, like the, like the bottom picture there, that was like screaming in your ear. And they would say things similar to this. Like they would tell you, you know, one more, one more rep. 
You know, no, no pain, no gain. They, they, would, they would encourage you and holler at you to do your very best. And a lot of times they would say these two words, don't quit. And so this morning, I, I want those two words to burn in your mind. I, my, my goal is for you to be constantly thinking about those two words, don't quit. You know, when I think about the whole process of physical therapy and, and exercise and stuff, I can't help but think about the comedian John Panette. And if you, if you have any idea of who John Panette is, he or was, he's passed away now, but he, uh, he often talked about diets and physical activity and all that kind of stuff because he was pretty overweight. And one of the things that he talked about is having a, a, a trainer, a, an exercise trainer, and going to the gym. And he started out, he starts out by saying that, listen, I, you know, they, even though they're asking me to do push-ups and sit-ups and all these things, but I don't do ups. And I kind of I feel like, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I go along with this. I don't do ups. I, uh, you know, ups, first of all, up is defying gravity, right? And gravity is the law. And I obey the laws, <laughs> okay? He goes on to say that I don't, I don't do ups, I do downs. So like, sit down, lay down, give me a cheeseburger, I'll wolf it down. Play some music, I'll boogie down. Right? But I don't do ups, right? And, that, and that's kind of the way I felt about physical therapy. But I had to push through. And I had somebody in my ear that was saying to me, don't quit. And I honestly believe that this is the biggest challenge that faces the American church today. Is that we have people who are quitting. And really, there are two different kinds of quitting. Like, we have people that are quitting doing church, and and I know that that's bad grammar, but but they quit quit coming to church. They quit being involved at all. They just quit church. But then there's also people that fall into another group of quitting. In In the secular workforce, we would call this quiet quitting. You know, the the people that, they're still on the payroll, but they're not committed anymore. They're not working their hardest. They're not working their best. In fact, some of times, you know, they're not working at all. They're just collecting a paycheck. They're quiet quitting. They haven't gone in and handed in their notice. They haven't walked out the door, but they're really not contributing a lot. And you see, our churches are suffering Because we have people, first of all, that are walking out the door and not coming back. But then we also have people that are walking in the door that are kind of, you know, attending on Sunday morning and then walking out and never to be seen again. Not involved, not plugged in, not serving, not engaged in any way. In fact, this is exactly what what Pastor David is, is preaching on. Last week he talked about being the salt of the earth. Next week he's talking about the light of the earth. Like that is, it's being the church. It's, it's being the hands and feet of Jesus, living out and engaging our faith. So I want to encourage you to don't, that you don't quit. And to do that, let's take a look at John chapter 6 together, first of all. John chapter 6. We're picking up towards the end of the chapter. Earlier in the chapter, we see that that Jesus has just performed an incredible miracle. We call it the feeding of the 5,000. In reality, it's it's many more than that because it was a first century Jewish custom to only count the men. And so it could have been 15, 20,000 people. But Jesus miraculously fed the entire crowd. And then he began to use that feeding, that physical food, as an analogy to be able to teach them about spiritual food. And so let's pick up in verse 52. It says, Then the Jews disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus had said, If you eat my flesh 
and drink my blood. And so Jesus said to them again, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. And as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he will also live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread your fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. And Jesus said these things in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. With many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, do you take offense? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And Jesus said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. And then I feel like verse 66 is probably one of the saddest verses in all the scripture, because it says this, after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. They quit. And when you think about this, you know, Jesus is, is giving them an analogy, and they're taking it so literally, they misunderstood what he was saying to them, but he was trying to describe to them the cost of discipleship. That following him was not just going to be all miracles and amazing things, that there was going to be challenges to being a Jesus follower. And so these people that had, that had followed Jesus, they were following him across the countryside. They had seen him do miracles. They had just participated in one of his greatest miracles. They, they'd heard his teaching. These people that were following Jesus literally decided to quit and walk away. Now, sometimes when we talk about the, the New Testament, we talk about Koine Greek, we talk about the, the, the intricacies of the, of the words, and sometimes the Greek is a, a complex language. And so, for instance, you probably have heard messages about the fact that there are four different Greek words that we all, we all interpret into English as love. And so each word in the Greek language has a, a, has a unique meaning and it, and it helps us to under, understand Scripture more meaningfully. So as, as you dig into verse 66 and actually the, the verses around this and you see that word disciple, you, you may think that that word means something like, you know, casual friend, you know, or, or, or maybe a distant follower, or, or a groupie. But here's the thing, as, as you dig into that, that Greek word, I know this is going to be shocking, but the word disciple really means disciple. Like, this same Greek word is used 72 times throughout the New Testament, and it's used in reference to people like Peter, James, John, and others. Disciples! These were not just some people that passed by or that was following Jesus for a day or two. These are disciples. But they quit. They quit. So how can we apply this today? How can we, how can we deal with this and work through this today? Well, I want to look at this from a generational standpoint. And, and as you look at this, you know, each generation has its own set of struggles. And, and I realize that some of this is generalization, but, but in general, each, each generation struggles with different aspects and, and different reasons why they are quitting. 
And let me just say a couple things real quick about, about generations. So, so I missed one generation right in here. I skipped Gen X. And so if you're Gen X, you can, you can identify whatever you want to identify as, okay? Um, the other thing is millennials, you know, sometimes older generations will call everybody younger than them millennials. Millennials, the older millennials are now in their 40s. They are becoming grandparents, okay? So you've got millennials. Then you've got this Gen Z. And then there's actually another generation that's coming below them called Gen Alpha. And guess what? That generation is only a couple years away from joining our youth groups. So now that I've made you feel really old, I want you to, I want you to consider the fact that leaving churches is not just something that, that's happening for younger generations. George Barna in his organization did some research. They continually do research on the, on the state of the church, the, the, the health of the church. And, and here's one of the things that he said, some of the, the biggest declines in church attendance, so this is quit, quitting doing the church, is in the older generation. It's, it's the adults 55 and older. We can't just blame this on the, on the young people anymore. In fact, he goes on and he talks about the fact that, that people are leaving the church and it is all the different age groups. It's not just one particular age group. We have people leaving the church. They're quitting. And so this morning what I'd like to do is from Scripture is address each one of these generations. And now the truths uh, that are going to be, we're going to see from God's word, they're transcendent. They apply to all of us. But I think each generation has its own struggle and so it will be uh, very applicable to them. And so let's take a look at 1 Kings chapter 19. In 1 Kings chapter 19, we'll see a situation that I think applies to our older generation. In 1 Kings 19, we're picking up the story of Elijah. And, and if you go back to chapter 18, Elijah just had his most amazing uh, ministry experience, the, the, his greatest accomplishment really probably of his life up to that point. If you know the story of chapter 18, what he did is he challenged the pagan priests to, to bring out their pagan God to show the power of the pagan God in comparison to Jehovah, the one true almighty God. And Elijah even had a little bit of fun with this. If you go through chapter 18, it's kind of amusing because he, start, he even makes fun of them and, and he's teasing them. And, and, and then God just does this incredible miracle through Elijah. He, he has, he's wiped out the pagan priests. He's had this great victory. But now we find him in chapter 19 and he's running for his life because the queen, Queen Jezebel, wants to kill him. And so in verse 4 it says, But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked God that he might die. I mean, listen, there's quitting, and then there's really quitting, right? He's asking, like, God, I, I, he says, it's enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on, a hot, on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank, and he laid down again. And the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food, for 40 days and 40 nights to Oreb, the mount of God. Elijah wanted to quit. He had just had his greatest victory, but yet now he wants to quit. And God came and intervened and gave him provisions and miraculously provided for him out in the middle of the desert. And so there's, there's this spiritual truth that that I think applies here, 
is never underestimate the spiritual value of a nap and a snack. You know, sometimes our older generation, listen, you just need a nap and a snack. But don't quit. Don't quit what God has called you to do. Don't quit being the church. Don't quit attending the church. As the statistics showed earlier, we have some of this generation that is, is, is actually walking out and leaving the church. They've left over preferences. It's not my style of music. It's not my style of preaching. Whatever, whatever their, their reason or the excuses, there's some people that are walking out. But there's also, within that generation, there's that temptation to rest on your ministry accomplishments. I've, I've served the church for 40 years. I've been a, a deacon for 20 years. I've been a Sunday school teacher for 30 years. Listen, just because that you have committed your life and you have done great things for God doesn't mean you have an opportunity to quit. Can you do the things that you used to do? Maybe not. Serve in a different way. But don't quit. We have this concept in America today called retirement. And listen, retirement is part of the American economy. It's, it's how our, our system of work happens. But listen, retirement is part of the American economy, but retirement is not part of the spiritual economy. We don't, you don't see that principle anywhere in Scripture. Paul talks about fighting the good fight and finishing the race. Don't quit. You know, John Piper in his book, Don't Waste Your Life, tells the story of a, of a couple a couple that worked very hard to be able to retire early. And, they, and, and when they got to that point, they retired early and they spent every day on the beach. And their goal in life was to be able to just get to that point where they could just spend time on the beach and collect seashells. And John Piper posed this question. He said, what is it going to be like when that couple stands before the Lord and says, Jesus, do you want to see my seashells? <laughs> what a waste. <clears throat> Listen, there's nothing wrong with working hard and and. and, and achieving financial independence and those type of things if your motivation is correct. And there's nothing wrong with, with retirement from work. There's nothing wrong from wanting to, to travel and enjoy things. But listen, don't do it at the expense of ministry, of being the church. Don't quit. Don't quit. But then I think there's a, another generation that we can talk about. The, the middle generation. And if you would join me in Luke chapter 10. In Luke chapter 10, we see Jesus. He's, he's involved in traveling from town to town, doing his, doing his ministry, preaching and, and healing but then he takes a stop. And in verse 38, it says, Now, as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village. We know this village to be Bethany. An important part of, important place in, in, in the, the different ministries that Jesus did. It's only a few miles away from Jerusalem. And so he entered this village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. 
But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. As you as you consider how this passage applies to us, applies to that, that middle generation, it applies to all of us. You know, there, there are often times that in life we become so busy that our busyness distracts us from being the church, from, from doing ministry, from being the hands and feet of Jesus. We get, we get so involved in, in, in the things of the world we work hard, so we play hard. And, and we get involved in all these different activities. And, and, and so then we do think, you know, we buy a boat, and then Sunday morning, well, that's the best time to go out. So we start going out on a boat on Sunday morning, and we stop attending church. And then, and then soon, you know, we stop attending church, and then we stop, you know, we stop being involved at all in ministry. Like, we just, we quit. We, we allow the things of the world to distract us and keep us busy, so busy that we're not of any spiritual value and good. But then on the flip side, we, we could be like Martha. Like, we could be so involved in church activities, so committed to doing everything that we possibly can to be involved in ministry that we begin to ignore relationships. We're, 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 we, we wear a badge of honor because we're involved in all these different ministries. Here's the problem. Both of those extremes can lead to quitting because you can serve and, and, and burn yourself out and get to the point where you literally walk away from the church. And I've seen this happen. And so we need to, to take lessons from God's word and learn that we are not to quit. And I think here's the, here's the challenge that that middle generation has to wrestle with, is understanding your why and being able to make good priorities. Simon Sinek wrote a, a couple of great books that are leadership business books. Uh, the first one was start with why. The second one was finding your why. And there's some great concepts in there. But then those concepts, we need to be able to build on and be able to filter them through God's word and be able to say, like, we're going to make priorities in light of eternity. Not just what is accomplishing things now, not just what gives us the best return on investment, but but what investment are we making for eternity? So listen, to, to each of these groups, to the group that is just too busy doing things and distracted by the world, I will say this, that if you're too busy to be in God's word each day, if you are too busy to be involved in the church, if you are too busy to be the church. Say it with me. You're too busy. But if you're like Martha, I want to share the words of a song with you. There's a song a few years ago by Larnell Harris entitled, I Miss My Time With You. And it's written in such a way that it's God speaking to you. It's God speaking to us and saying he misses his time of communion and fellowship with us. I miss my time with you, those moments together. I need to be with you each day, and it hurts me when you say, you're too busy. Busy trying to serve me, but how can you serve me when your spirit's empty? There's a longing in my heart wanting more than just a part of you. It's true. I miss my time with you. So listen, have balance in your life. Have clear priorities. But don't quit. 
don't quit. And the last, the last group that I want to address is the younger generation. If you would join me in John chapter 21. John chapter 21 is one of my favorite passages to preach from. There's just, there's so much here. There's so, it's so, there's so, it's so rich and deep and there's so many principles. But I want to just look at a, at a couple verses here. And again, this is, this is directed at the younger generation, but these are, these are universal truths. The, these, these things may apply to you no matter what age you are. In John chapter 21, verses 1 through 3, it says this. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. And they said to him, we will go with you. And they went out and they got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. And we could go into the story of the miracles that Jesus did, providing the fish and, and, and the, the confrontation with Peter and all the different things here. But I want you to just scroll down to verse 14. Because verse 14 summarizes this saying, this was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So we have the disciples who followed Jesus they saw his crucifixion. They saw his burial. They've seen him twice in resurrected bodily form. He had defeated death and sin. And where are they at? They've gone fishing. They went back to their, to their former ways, to their old life. And you have to wonder why. Now listen, Scripture isn't explicitly clear on this, but I, I think it doesn't take a, a sleuth to know that the, the apostles were disillusioned. They were disappointed. Because, you see, God didn't do what they thought he was going to do. And God didn't do... What, he, what they thought he was going to do when they thought he was going to do it. And he didn't do it how he thought, how they thought God was going to do it. They were disappointed. They were disillusioned. They had followed Jesus thinking that Jesus was going to bring about the kingdom, the Davidic promise in the Old Testament, that they, he was going to defeat the Roman Empire, that the Israel nation was going to be freed from their oppression, and they were going to set up the earthly kingdom. But God said, I've got something better for you. Yeah, I'm going to do that eventually, but first I want to set up this spiritual kingdom on earth, and I want you to be a part of it. But see, they went fishing. And so to the younger generation, I want to encourage you with this. Listen, it's okay to deconstruct your faith. This is a common phrase that you see, not just in the church, but, but in, in a lot of different areas. Deconstruction. Tearing apart what we've been taught in the past. Listen, it's okay. It's okay to question what you've been taught. As long as after you're done deconstructing, you reconstruct. You see, there are people that quit in the middle of that. They start deconstructing what they've learned, and then they walk away, and they leave the faith. But that isn't true of our apostles here, because even though they were questioning what they were taught, even though they had spent time with Jesus, before he was resurrected, now they're spending time with Jesus. And we see in chapter 21 of John, we see the early part of Acts, that now they finally understand, they reconstruct their faith into a new understanding and a new faith. 
And these are the very men that become world changers. They turn the world upside down. Why? Because they didn't quit. So you might be sitting there going, this is kind of a straw man argument. Like, I'm not going to quit. Why do I need to hear this? Well, may I um, remind you that the Apostle Peter said the exact same thing. When the Lord confronted him and said, you're going to deny me, Peter's like, oh, no, not me, Lord. I'll never deny you. Like, I'll die first before I do that. This can happen to any one of us. And I will tell you from personal experience that I have struggled with this at each stage of life. You say, but you were a pastor. Yeah, but listen, there were times I wanted to quit. There were times as a pastor that I just said, man, like what am I, what am I wasting my time on? And there were other occasions throughout my life that I struggled with these very same things. But listen, the church needs you. Ephesians 4 talks about the, the, the body of Christ, both the universal and I believe even the local church, that God has designed us with each with unique abilities, spiritual gifts, natural talents that come together and, and synthesize, they come together and, and the whole becomes greater than the individual parts. The church needs you. You have been gifted in a way that benefits the body of Christ. The church needs you. But also the opposite is true. You need the church. There is this misnomer that somehow you can have the spiritual life and, and and the spiritual journey all alone. That's so unbiblical. Every, every example that we see in the New Testament, it's a community of believers coming together and encouraging one another, challenging one another. The church needs you, and you need the church. Don't quit. Maybe you remember this movie, Facing the Giants. And in this scene in the movie, we have Brock, who's a, a leader on the team, and, and Brock has a lot of doubts. Brock doesn't think that the, the team is going to win, that they can, they can defeat their, their upcoming opponent. And so the coach wants to, wants to teach him a lesson and, and teach the rest of the team a lesson. And it's a lesson that we can learn from as well. And so the coach makes him do what's called this death crawl. And you can see this picture of this, the idea of, of being on your, your toes and on your hands, but your knees can't touch the ground, and you're crawling across the football field. But then to make it more challenging, he puts another player on his back. And then on top of that, he blindfolds him so that he doesn't see where he is on the field. And he starts doing this death crawl. And the coach is encouraging. The coach is coming alongside of him and encouraging him to, to do his best. Give me your all. And Brock thinks he's on the 50-yard line. But the coach is in his ear, and the coach keeps saying things like, don't stop, don't quit, keep going, don't quit. And eventually Brock drops of exhaustion. And the coach has him take off his blindfold. And he sees that he's in the end zone. But it's because he had someone coming alongside him. Saying to him, don't quit. Don't quit. And so this morning, I want these words to ring in your ears. I want these words to stick with you. Because, you see, unlike some people will take that story from facing the giants and say, it's all about giving your best. It's all about working your hardest. I would say it goes beyond that. Because biblically, we know that it's the Holy Spirit that dwells within us. And that is where we derive our power from. If you've put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, 
You have the Holy Spirit indwelling with you, the power of God within you to have the ability to press through those difficult times and not to quit. And you also have the support of fellow believers. You have those around you who should be saying to you, in one way or another, don't quit. This morning, what I like, just turn to the person on your left and, and say to them, don't quit. And, and turn to the person on your right and say, don't quit. And then this may seem really weird, but point to yourself and just say, don't quit. Don't quit. God wants to accomplish great things in you and through you. Don't quit. Would you bow your heads? Close your eyes? I want to take just a moment to address a group of people that we've pretty much ignored this morning. If you're here this morning and you have never made the decision to follow Jesus, you've never accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, you might be sitting there going, well, why would I want to join something that a lot of other people are quitting? Listen, that's not, that's not the point of what we were talking about this morning. The Christian life is an amazing experience of living in communion with God through his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ gave himself on the cross. He shed his blood he died, he rose again, he defeated sin and death, and he did that for you. And you have an opportunity to have a, a, a reestablished relationship with the creator of the universe and to live eternally with fellowship with him. The opposite is to live eternally outside of fellowship, away from the presence of God. So if you've never made that decision this morning, please come forward as we sing and give us an opportunity to show you from God's word what it means to be a Jesus follower. But with every head bow, every eye closed, I want to speak to those that the majority of this message was about. It was those who have put their faith and trust in Jesus. I want to encourage you that it's through the power of the Holy Spirit that you can overcome this desire at times to quit. And this morning, I want to close reading a doxology. I want to, I want to close by actually praying scripture for you. And so if you would, pray with me. As I read from God's word, a doxology. It says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling or quitting and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, and now and forever. Amen.